tonight, tonight's meeting for the Mount Abraham Board is warned as a public meeting. It's something we have to do because we're all together. So um, we can't have a meeting without warning. So we're warning the meeting as a Mount Abraham meeting, but the format's going to be a little different. Um, we will not be doing our board work here at this meeting. We will have a presentation. So I'll take public comment, but um, after the presentation, there's a question and answer time for people to ask questions and answers. I'm going to ask board members to hold back a little and let their community members let them get their questions out first as we go. And then um, we'll adjourn the meeting, and then the local meetings will happen after that. And there'll be room. I, I imagine room designations that they'll announce at the end of the meeting. So, for the Mount Abraham Board, is there any public comment at this time? Okay. All right. Hearing none, I'll move on. Um, Jess, the Mount Abraham Principal, Jeff Barowitz, is going to do the pre presentation tonight, so I'll turn it over to Jess. Thank you. I was hoping for more community members, but hey, this is a great crowd. Um, I'll give you some context here that I just also presented this uh, budget presentation to mounting faculty as well. So there's a lot of people who are giving up. So while we're going. I will try to yell. Yes, use teacher voice. Like certainly give me a signal if I'm if I get quieter. Uh, so without further ado, we shall dive in. Uh, there is a good amount of context that I also want to share with you uh, as we look really at our mission to ambitiously uh, maintain a stimulating and respectful environment in which all students are engaged, all pursue and promote learning, and all participate as active and responsible citizens. I hope that you can see that mission threaded throughout the finances and the budget. It's really important to me that our budget shows the narrative of our school and really helps us to achieve uh, this mission. So a little bit of context about the budget development process, just so you kind of can see where a lot of this came uh, came about from. Uh, I started with a feedback form to all faculty members, and we had a very high, I think, 89% completion rate from all faculty members, um, asking them what they thought the unmet needs were, um, where efficiencies could be gained, and really asked for a lot of input about um, the budget and how we use our resources. Uh, really trying to underscore that how we use our time and our money is exactly how we can achieve anything. And so got a lot of really great feedback reviewed uh, three-year averages and trends and really went through and worked through the last three years of the budget of Mount Aid. Uh, with turnover and leadership, the budget philosophy shifts, and so really wanted to try to uh, understand that narrative better myself. And as you know, we've also had um, some surpluses uh, in the last few years and wanting to really make sure that we can tell the narrative of where our funds go and really start to kind of right-size the budget so that our uh, we're no longer having uh, large surpluses that um, don't tell the story of, of our resources and our needs as a school. So uh, really worked through the last three years and got a lot of good information there. And then also uh, teacher leaders with input from all of their department <coughs> members submitted their own budget requests, you know, and it's very standard consumable supplies, textbooks, all of that. But again, um, as a new principal there, really wanting to make sure that I understood the needs of the school, of students and teachers, to make sure that we could really provide an adequate budget. And you know I promised you um, at the board meeting when you set a recommendation where um, there was some conversation of zero to two percent, and I really um, took the great responsibility of, of knowing that we could bring you the lowest possible budget that would maintain the integrity of the programming. And that was really my goal and has been my goal throughout. So. Um, really took that information to heart as uh, we were moving forward. So each teacher leader I met with individually to better understand the needs of the department, the needs of students, and so that we can really start to move into a multi-year budget cycle. Obviously we can't meet all of those needs in one year, but to better understand that narrative and better understand the needs to really start to move into a more long-term budget process that can take into account needs over the course of several years. Um, so. In the end, teacher leaders also presented their budget requests to each other to start to have that transparency. But I, you, know, you might think it's silly to start with this, but having the context of really how much input and how much discussion went into this budget <coughs> is important, um, and really helping people to have transparency and so they don't necessarily see uh, competing for resources, but build some empathy and understanding for the larger picture of what the whole school is trying to achieve. Um, 
and really uh, started there, kind of making sure that there were equitable increases, uh, that we could really connect funds back to the department that they really belong to, and started to really make sure that the budget started to tell the narrative. Of the <coughs> So uh, you'll notice also that uh, once we get to our numbers, that the uh, as the consolidation of special education services um, has progressed, you will see that our expenses and our revenue have dropped significantly. Uh, there was a split second where uh, our expenses dropped significantly, and we didn't have the revenue numbers yet, and thought, ooh, we have all this money to play with. But don't worry, that only lasts a second. Um, so we will jump into that a little bit more when you see the numbers, but um, be conscious of that, because that really started to, to shift. Um, and you'll see some numbers that are a bit more right-sized based on a lot of that stuff. So um, we have control over staffing level supplies and equipment. That's a very, it's really, we don't have control over too much, really, when it comes to budgeting. And it's a moving target. So we have less control of salaries, benefits, revenue, student needs, right? We can have students who move to our district uh, tomorrow and need to meet their, their educational needs um, authentically. So that has an implication on the budget. Transportation has gone up 12%. Uh, fuel and electricity rates are, are undetermined, really. We don't know as those fluctuate. And a big part of uh, what is out of Mount Abe's control really right now is the condition of the facility. Um, we know that there has been a pretty significant amount of deferred maintenance, and we know that we have to provide students with an environment in which they can thrive and learn. So um, I consider that uh, something that is a bit out of our control, and um, you'll see a scenario which asks for your input into how much control we can have on that going forward. So our current reality right now, um, just to give you a context of how this year has gone, how the budget um, has really been applied this year, and what your return on investment really is, and that's really what I want to focus on as we go forward. Um, how can we be sure that the money we are putting into uh, educating students and into the school really has uh, the effects that we desire and, and has the maximum amount of impact on kids. And so uh, this year we can really see that there have been some positive shifts in school culture. Um, we did some shifting around um, of positions and really strengthening our PBIS, Positive Behavioral Interventions and Supports. Um, have a dean of students position who's really uh, making response to inappropriate behavior and proactive response to, um, to with students is really having a positive inf impact. We have 46% uh, less behavior referrals this year than as compared to last year. Um, so we know that that was a really good investment, uh, both in personnel and in <coughs> money. Uh, we're in the process of trying to align our 7 through 12 bell schedule. Um, right now, the 7-8 operates on a different bell schedule than 9 through 12. Um, and actually, that committee starts tomorrow. And some of that is to make sure that we have, we can use the flexibility of our resources to the best of our ability. Right now, it's really challenging for staff who might want to teach uh, in the middle school, but maybe teach one high school class, or to um, be more flexible with their time. And so an aligned bell schedule will help us to have that flexibility to meet student needs um, and give us a little bit more flexibility. Um, you should know faculty right now are engaged in a really collective, collaborative inquiry around three key systems in our school. PBIS, so positive behavior, what is our school culture like? Uh, MTSS, multi-tiered system of supports, how are we supporting all students to learn and how are we intervening when they're not? Uh, making the gains that we hope for and then uh, proficiency-based learning. Because you know by 2020, we will have an operational system in which all students are actually graduating based on their uh, meeting of proficiencies as opposed to seat time and credits. Um, and we want to do that really with integrity. And so as those groups are working this year, and what I've shared with faculty is that this is our year to hit the pause button and really reflect on where are we now, what systems are working, where do we want to seek for improvements, and how can we better meet student needs, and sort of take this one year of being a new principal and kind of being able to pause and reflect and evaluate where we are and where we want to go as a school. And so um, I have, as you'll see soon, really proposed a pretty level service budget because until we, have, we know what those priorities are, we have looked at our data and we have really collectively identified uh, what we want to do to achieve that vision that all students will succeed at Mount Abe. Um, 
I, we can't guarantee that return on investment. And so I really did not want to add positions that um, would not necessarily guarantee those outcomes. And this year is going really well, and we feel like we, we have the resources currently, um, at least for one more year, to really make sure that we take that time to align our resources in the appropriate way. So, and those work groups are instrumental in making sure we make the, the right calls about um, where we want to head as a school. Um, as I said, we're moving to a personalized proficiency-based system. We're in the messy part right now, um, but we could very easily um, make A's, fours, and call it a day. But we want to make sure it's really uh, has integrity. It's done with authenticity, and that we really see the outcomes in student learning. That all of this significant uh, investment of resources, time, and personnel promise. So we're really making sure we take the, the chance to transform. Uh, and you'll see a decrease in debt service, special education expenses, and revenue. So all of these things are where we are currently. Uh, where we want to go is really uh, implementing that proficiency-based system with fidelity. Uh, and next year, we have a really interesting uh, way to creatively use resources to hopefully achieve uh, better results with students. And so we plan for a learning commons, which is really, uh, if you probably been to many of you know the library has classrooms surrounding it and those classrooms um, we want to transform into a literacy lab and a STEM lab and so to ideally um, staff each of those um, with a special educator a regular educator um, and hopefully a paraeducator and on a kind of rotating basis so no one one person necessarily will cover all of it um, in order to target interventions with students or extensions with students um, and so to make sure that when students are um, struggling, they have a really um, good content expert and an access expert, basically, and a special educator to make sure that um, they have those supports in place. And then a callback system. Uh, in, our, in our scheduling um, feedback from faculty, thank goodness they agreed because uh, callback, it's really a slot of time, in case you don't know, where you can um, call students back who are struggling on a specific skill um, or if extend um, their learning to, to really challenge them as well. So, um, you know, 95% of faculty agreed we needed a callback system um, to implement for next year. So, um, really was making sure to target resources to make sure that happens. And so, again, it's about that move to proficiency-based learning. That if we create this system in the culture now, that when we are operational in 2020, it really will be a powerful system of learning for students. And so, um, as we move from that, we also know that there are students who need more community and career-based learning. That when we're personalizing learning, we want students to have experiences uh, that prepare them for college, career, community. And so um, in the budget, you'll, there is a small increase to uh, help the, uh, a wider variety of students who are not necessarily ac accessing our personalized learning department to access those resources in the community, uh, which is pretty exciting. And then um, a big piece that is going to be part of uh, discussion tonight is how can we make sure this budget improves our likelihood of a successful bond vote. Um, we know we've got the rev up committee starting. We know that that's a significant investment and that uh, bond payments are very large. And if we don't start planning for it now, um, it will really make it very challenging in the future. So, um, and really making sure we get the facility that supports students in the way that we really want and, and shows them how much we value them in education. So um, all of that is really to focus and align resources to student needs. So that's what really this budget is, is designed to do. So here's the nitty gritty numbers. I'll give you a second to digest. Um, this is without the bond consideration. So I would um, put that out there, that there's a second scenario in which um, I have put in some funds to potentially go toward the first bond payment, which if, if and when the bond passes next November, that um, we have that cushion in there to pay that first bond payment. So you'll see there's a lot of fluctuation here. Uh, I think the curtain is a little, it's cutting me off there a little bit. But uh, the change in revenue is mostly due to that consolidation of special education. So not only are the expenses um, coming out of the budget, the revenue is also now coming out of the budget. So that's how you see the revenue has really significantly dropped. Um, and what I have presented really is what I think is the bare minimum to do all of this ambitious work that we want to do um, with our current um, service and staffing levels is about a little over a half a percent increase. So I feel like really trying to hit that target of the lowest possible while maintaining the integrity of the programming for students. 
um, you'll see it's, it's kind of because of those revenue shifts and because of um, a lot of different factors. I think some of the narrative the budget tells over these last three years is a little bit inconsistent because of different approaches to budgeting. Uh, but this is what I would argue is an acceptable budget to achieve that grand vision we have for all of our students. But I'll layer on a, com a complex factor that this is only taking into consideration $250,000 in construction services, which is the same line we would put in about a million dollars for a bond uh, payment. So if we were to add in uh, $750,000 into that line in order to make sure we had that million dollars to pay the first bond payment, um, this is what the budget would look like. So as you digest that, um, really thinking about if we had increased our budget just by 2%. Many districts, right, they just just do the 2% increase, just do the steady 2% increase, and so I think. Excuse me, sorry. Oh, now the refrigerator. Spoil the milk. Thanks, you spoil it. Uh, I can talk louder too, teacher voice. Uh, as we consider uh, the bond vote and really thinking about the 7.17, if we had just done um, pretty steady increases over the last few years of 2%, 2%, 2%, this actually hits us right at that target. Um, and so it looks really shocking right now, but it is because of some really good fiscal conservativity over the last few years that has really um, made this look like a really large increase, but it's also um, padded and protected us so that if we do have this increase, it really has been an average over the last three years of a 2% increase. Um, just maybe hard to wrap your mind around, but um, is a fun logic puzzle to think about. So I am willing to bet you have many, many questions. I know I didn't cover all of the new groups, so fire away. And hopefully everybody has their packets as well. I'm sure you want these numbers in front of you. creating a lot of the different systems that will be operational by 2020. So current ninth graders, we've identified our proficiencies, courses are, t are aligning toward those proficiencies, but our current 12th graders, like they will not graduate with a transcript that reflects all of those practices. So it's, and it's really the callback system, all the different ways that we will ensure students still graduate in a very typical timeline, but is, are still meeting proficiency. done for less than $20 million. Um, I feel like the $33 million that was asked for a few years ago, obviously the community spoke loudly and said that is, it's too much, that's not something we're willing to support. Um, but also that plan did not address some of the things we know need to be addressed. Um, and so I'm wondering if some of the more ambitious pieces of that renovation um, would not happen, but we would address the bones of the building to make sure that it was really structurally 
sound and we can do electrical, the plumbing, the things that weren't included in that in that big box payment. So it's almost, as a teacher said, I gave um, a similar presentation to the faculty today, and as a teacher said, it was almost like a blessing in disguise that it did not pass because now we know that there are issues that we can address now um, in a more proactive way. <coughs> but without the committee, without any of that, it's a shot in the dark. I just wondered if you had a goal. So, oh, I have a couple of questions. One, sure. but one is about what you're saying. I, I don't know if we understand what you mean, what you're talking about when you're talking about a bond issue. Are you talking about a bond issue for renovation, for addition to the school? Renovation. Just renovation. And um, so you're talking about uh, uh, a bond payment on how big of a uh, 20 million. That's, that, that's the guess right now. That that would be probably the lowest possible that we could do what needs to be done to the building. And, and are you in, so you're contemplating a $20 million bond issue vote in the near future, or are you at the just very early stages of talking? Um, well, at the last board meeting, the board um, did uh, give their recommendation to start the rev-up committee again. Um, we know there's some significant needs at, in the Mount A building. I think the gym floor is a really huge symbol of the issues that we're having. And even with surpluses each year, we're putting between two hundred fifty to $500,000 um, into just facilities right now. And, and to be perfectly honest with you, and we, we say this a lot, uh, it's a little bit of lipstick on the pig right now. And so we can either be really proactive and ask for a bond and make this a really sound building, um, or we can continue to chip away and basically waste money in the, in the long term because that money is really putting patches in a building that needs some significant work. And so it's, it, it is hard to swallow, but I think it's more fiscally responsible to do what we need to do now so that we have a sound building for the long haul rather than to keep kind of siphoning money off of the educational budget to keep putting patches. And the $20 million is really just a ballpark figure. So we know a bond went out before for $31 million or something like that, and that didn't pass. And we assume it didn't pass because it was too high a figure that taxpayer, for taxpayers to support. So just as a, as a means for starting a conversation, putting $20 million in instead of the 31 to get a sense of what would the impact be on a budget should this group that's forming uh, be successful in putting together a bond um, at some point in the not too distant And regardless, a lot of unknowns. Yeah. And if it, if it were not to pass and we have this money built into the budget, we know we need to dump it right back into the building. So it's really either way. Fred? Well, it, it wouldn't be realistic to have a bond vote and, and, yeah, for the F-18 right, budget cycle, right? I mean, you're just showing us that. Um, Say again, Brad, I need to hear your question. You know, we have a, uh, you know, we have these budgets so in town meeting, we, we, you know, we print in January, yeah. right? I mean, you're not seriously thinking of uh, doing a bond vote before then, are you guys? Mm -hmm. um, seriously thinking about November. Really? Mm -hmm. it's, it's that bad. Okay. It's that necessary. Wow. But I think part of, part of the conversation that needs to ensue when this group is officially formed is what's the timeline and going back to almost literally going back to the drawing board. We have drawings from the previous work, taking a look at some of that, thinking about what is a reasonable um, scope of work to ask for, and getting a sense of what would the cost for that be. 20 million is just a figure put out there, again, for means of conversation. If it were, if, so if it were 10 million, we could calculate what would the impact on the budget be there. If it were 30 million, we could calculate from there. And this three quarters of a million debt services as principal and interest, do you have any, do you know what your assumptions were on the details of the bond? 15 year? Uh, we were thinking uh, 20 year, 20 year bond, a million dollars a year. It was really, it was, it's rough figures at this point with so much unknown, but it was at least a, a way to keep that placeholder in mind should we get the community support to offer. What's the difference there, 750? So. Uh, we currently have 250000 that's in that construction services line that we would roll into that. Yeah. I 
wonder if you could talk a little bit more about how the proposed budget, either this one or the one before it, reflects um, the goals that you have for next year around proficiency-based learning, the callback in the learning commons, and community and career-based learning. Sure. Um, you, there is a slight increase in our current community and career-based learning um, coordinator that uh, is reflected in that. Um, the learning commons, they we're really trying to use some creative ways of using time and personnel. So um, rather than we currently have a guided study um, that is, it can be, it can range in its effectiveness and um, moving away from that to having uh, teachers have their sixth assignment in the learning commons. Um, so it's a bit more about realigning how we use resources and being more creative, um, which again I think comes down to being more, being fiscally conservative and doing more with a level service. And I think we can do that. Faculty are pretty excited about the Learning Commons model. We have a lot of people researching it to make sure that it's something that we implement well. And what about proficiency-based learning? How it's you... all we're doing. <laughs> that is so much of our work. Um, there, there is uh, currently a point to coach that we have in the building, um, which would like to increase. Um, and some of it is, uh, you'll notice, it's professional development. It's um, a lot of different pieces that are small, but when combined, um, will really create the support necessary to move the system. But we're really, teachers are very much invested in this work now, um, and it is, we're doing some really phenomenal work now, and so it's really just kind of staying the course and making sure that we keep our focus on proficiency-based learning. Because it's not just changing the pace of words, right? Exactly. Tell, tell us a little more about it. Sure. Sure. Um, it's really what it's making sure that we are very clear about what we want students to know and be able to do, and really making sure that our instruction aligns with that, and that our assessments, that students are actually given assessments that measure those outcomes. Um, but not also that feels very standardized. You know, I think there's a trap when you think about standards-based grading that everything becomes really standardized. And I think the personalized piece where students have some voice and some choice about how they have learning experiences that lead them to demonstrate those proficiencies. Um, and so I think we are more ahead in terms of the grading and the assessment piece. Um, and we definitely need to be working on what instructional shifts need to happen. How can we make sure that all of those uh, standards, really what we're calling learning targets, are aligned vertically, horizontally, to make sure that we give students a really um, supportive chance of moving through their grade level, um, even though really seat time, grade level, these things aren't really that um, important in a proficiency-based system, but that they can really move through to a trajectory of graduating in a similar timeline that they would have otherwise. Um, so it's, a, it's definitely a different mindset in terms of teaching, and it's a different mindset in terms of learning. Um, students move, end up moving away from, well, what can I do to get an A, to what's, what can I do to work on writing a thesis statement better, or writing a paragraph or an essay better, and it becomes much more focused on the learning than the grades. And we're seeing that a little bit already. You're saying that A was still ahead of the curve, or leading that? Yes, yes, definitely. Definitely, and I think among especially personal learning, personal learning, uh, that was something you like to tout. Yes, <laughs> definitely, definitely, and I think as we move forward, it's going to be more about um, yes, the personalized learning department is is really phenomenal, but then also making sure that all courses provide some element of personalization, so that we can really make sure that system wise, students have that voice choice and can really um, activate their learning based on their passions. I'm assuming that the purchase services line directly aligns with the AUSU budget from the previous. Yep, it does. The budget with bond payment has $70,000 fewer for student support services. Mm -hmm. It might be an error. What's that about? It might be an error. Okay. <laughs> to be honest, there was a last minute number that came in that I hope I did not give you. 
that's for the without bond. And if you were to go to the one with bond, it says 770 on the handout that I have. There was a last minute change that I tried to factor in and then ended up probably not backing it up. So it should say 45 yeah. on both of them? Yes. Okay. Thank you. No, it should say 770. It should say 770. Yeah, it should say 770. Oh, it should say 770. It says 770 and it should say what? 770 on both. Oh, um, um, sorry. It's a moving target almost every day until we get a lot of information. Um, two more questions. One is, and this one might be for Patrick, why are we anticipating that um, transportation uh, is going up 12%? And also, what are you anticipating for what, uh, as far as what enrollment is going to do at the end of the year? I can talk about the transportation. So we just got the bids in today. Uh, so we had been budgeting about a 6% increase in transportation. And when the actual bid, so I think there were two bids. One was considerably higher than the other. And unfortunately, the lower one was a 12% increase mm -hmm. in transportation. So uh, I think Jess incorporated that change into, into this presentation. Because again, those just came in today. So I think actually what you see here reflects the 6% which we had been working with, and rather than make that change right, right away today, we decided to let the presentation stay as it had been, and we'll have to update that for the next draft that we're seeing in December. But well, what's the justification? Do you know, Patrick, for a 12% um, increase? I only had a brief conversation with Howard, and what he explained to me was there are some stipulations in the RFP, the request for proposals, that stated that um, they could only run certain buses of, of particular age. So if there were buses that were too old, we decided they're unsafe and, and too unreliable to use. And so the cost for them to upgrade buses to meet that requirement had to be factored into the bid, mm -hmm. and that's part of what contributed to that increase in the in their bid proposal. And to your enrollment question, um, we have pretty steady enrollment right now. We have a small eighth grade class that is bubbling out, um, but it's nothing too significant that would warrant um, adding um, a significant amount of teachers or re reducing by a significant number of teachers. Enrollment's pretty steady right now. So you're just saying next year's enrollment will be about the same. Mm -hmm. I have a question about the buses. Is that the old bus issue? Is that something that's so much of an issue that we really need to stick with it in light of this 12% increase? Or is that something we can take out of the RFP and maybe bring that cost back down? I think it's, uh, I'd have to check, but I think it's, if not standard practice, best practice, not to be running old buses because of the complications that have come about if they're breaking down and getting kids to school and things of that nature, so, what's that? Catching on fire. Catching on fire, not that that's ever happened. <laughs> <in our day. laughs> so I, I think it's for all those experiences that, um, that that's put in there. So again, I don't know that it's necessarily standard practice, but I think it's pretty good practice. And I would offer that we know, I mean, it's, we know retirements have, some have announced that they'll retire, but it's not necessarily public yet. There's so many different factors. The state is still working on some other final numbers to school. So it's kind of with our current uh, level of information, this is what could be a fiscally conservative, but responsible to the education of students. With this number, or both numbers, <clears throat> how much of that added 750 gets added to the per pupil expense? Does it all get added to it? Yeah. So are we able to raise our per pupil expense that high? We're waiting on equalized pupil yeah. figures. So we, it's hard to say until we get that figure from the state, which we've been anticipating for a little while. Uh, there are some compounding factors this year in calculating the equalized pupil, factoring in all the, all the uh, pre-K stuff. So we now get um, credited equalized pupils for students that were paying for those 10 hours of pre-K. Um, for the high school? So, yeah, 
Or at least not high, well, no. not, not for the high school, but statewide, that's a new addition to the formula, which is gumming up the works for everything in terms of getting the equalized pupil out. That's our hypothesis okay. anyway. Because typically at this point, we at least have a sense of when they will get us. If, if we wouldn't already have had a draft equalized pupil figure, we'd have received communication about when they anticipate getting it. Now, we haven't quite gotten that yet. So it seems like the process is a little behind where it normally is at this point this year. And I would assume, though, that given the con how conservative we were in other areas, and that we would likely be in line with what the state is expected. We've also uh, retired some debt service this year, which is just chipping away a little bit at adding more. I thought that part when you looked at the edge of the per people spending that was without debt, or is that a different figure? Because it seems you get those the sheets from Howard and you see the one and then you see, you see it without debt, and I thought that was the figure that equalized <coughs> people cost. Which would mean that you wouldn't count the. Right, the last bond, that's what they told us that if you did the repairs as the bond that increase wouldn't count against your per pupil. So we have to, so I think we have to, I certainly for myself, I need to understand more about, there are some, some allowable expenses and other things that aren't allowable in terms of whether or not they count against your equalized pupil. Mm -hmm. I'd have to find out a little more detail exactly how that works. In terms of tax impact, so looking at how much money would need to be raised through taxes, that's what that bottom line is, and that, that shows with a bond, of 20 million, which is just a total guess as to what it could be, um, what that impact would be in terms of the number of dollars that would be needed and how those dollars compared to previous dollars would be needed. Simply by way of conversation, I think it's, it's premature to talk about impact on per pupil spending just yet because there's a lot to understand still. Um, I think that's all I think if I understand correctly, I just want to uh, check that you're saying you're not anticipating you're anticipating a, a small staffing increase for the um, proficiency based learning coach and then otherwise you're not expecting uh, in regular education anyway um, a, a, any other staffing increases or decreases yes Do I? there is a small increase for the community based learning coordinator but oh, other than that right. they're quite small in comparison to any other increases. But the other part to my question was, are you ex uh, what are you expecting in terms of increases or decreases in special education <coughs> staff again? That um, is really handled at the central office level. And so that's when you see that drop in expense and revenue. Um, that's something that's managed. All special education <coughs> faculty and staff are employed actually by the district. Um, we are currently, you know, to be transparent, we are currently looking at revamping our CATS program, our alternative program, um, to better meet the needs of those students. Um, and it's a, a small population right now. So which program are you hearing? CATS, is it, that's the affectionate the CATS, right, name okay. for it right now. Um, and so we are anticipating some pretty big programmatic changes, but I don't, regardless, we'll still, we have staffing needs to, to meet the needs of all students for sure. So. Maybe Susan, you could answer that question. We, we, at, our, at our presentation, we talked about um, the fact that we're sort of overstaffed in special education across the district. So we are looking at programming that where we can use staff more efficiently and effectively um, for, based on the needs of students. But much like everything else, it's a pretty um, it's a crystal ball right now in terms of knowing if we have a lot of students um, that we're finding a pattern of a lot of families moving into our district unexpectedly. So we'll probably use a process much like we um, started this year where we sat down as an administrative team and talked about needs across building and we deployed staff out to buildings based on the needs of students. So I anticipate that we'll, all, we'll continue to do that um, so that we're making sure we've got staff in the places where students need them. So you're not, at this point, anticipating an increase or a decrease in special education staffing at Mount Abraham, or you just don't know? I think we just really don't know. We haven't really 
dug deeply. Um, I mean, one, we're, we have a few a, a few ways of how we're looking at staffing to make sure that we have a ratio of staff to students that that makes sense. But it's pretty hard to tell. I mean, we know we have a large number of students um, coming up into the middle school that have needs. So, but again, it could, that could shift. And I, but just know we have a clear process for how we how we make that decision. Part of what we're part of a, a significant portion of work that we committed to as an administrative team this year and involving a lot of stakeholders that we talked about at the SU level was looking at a, a bit of a redesign in how we provide so, uh, services within student support services and we believe we can achieve some efficiencies in that redesign as we improve outcomes for kids. But to say exactly what that translates to in terms of staffing levels is really hard to say at this point. So when we see student support services here, it isn't special education. No, right. 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 This is, right. This is it's just school counselors, nurses. Right. Okay. All of the special education is under purchase services. Is under purchase services. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> and also knowing that as we strengthen our proficiency-based learning system and with callback and with learning labs that are really targeting skills regardless of whether a student is identified as a special education student, I think is another way of being more efficient and creative and being more inclusive as well. But so the decrease in purchase services there, pretty drastic decrease. I bet you said this and I didn't quite catch it. What is the, what is the cause of that? Uh, that is the, co the revenue is also being um, subtracted out as a result of centralization of special ed. So it was in the last budget cycle, it was just the expense and now the revenue is also being subtracted out as well. And now the so revenue is being out. Please. So the, the, the revenue used to go directly to schools. And so the, from the SU purchase services assessment, it would be that school's portion of the total cost of special ed expenses. And then the revenue that went directly to the schools offset the central office assessment. Now the revenue comes directly to central office. So we take the revenue out first, then assess the difference. So you'll notice that there's a significant decrease in purchase services because we've decreased the assessment because we get the revenue now. But you'll also notice for Mount A, the revenue went down considerably because they don't get that revenue anymore. It comes to us first. So it kind of it comes out in the wash, but it was just a transition of uh, revenue coming directly to the SU to reduce the assessment rather than revenue going directly to the school to offset the assessment. So, uh, I'm not sure I completely understand, but um, if I, if I, in case I did, <laughs> did um, it, if we were looking at apples to apples, would the purchase services number from FY17 to FY18 be about the same? Yes, because the, the so looking specifically in the area of special education, if you remember back to the SU presentation, it was essentially a flat, if I'm recalling correctly, the, the special education portion of the purchase services from last year, from this year to proposed, was flat. So if there was a difference, it was a difference in the rate of the revenue we got, not based on any expenses. Okay, thanks. So if I'm, if I'm following this right, looking at the difference in revenue from uh, 17 to 18 is about 1.1 million. Looking at the difference in purchase services is about 1.2 million. So that's and so they're they're, they're, they're canceling each other out exactly. More. And and the apples to apples concept was something we talked a lot about. And how do we put this together in a format that does give you an apples to apples comparison? And ultimately, what we thought did that best was, regardless of where revenue comes in and where expenses show up the difference between total expenses and total revenue is the same. When we say it comes out in the wash, that's where we see it come out in the wash. So that bottom line, the amount to be raised by taxes, that's total expenses, we're subtracting out total revenue, that really gives you the apples to apples comparison across those three years. Getting back to anticipated equalized people, and I should, I don't know this maybe, but um, is there a, is there a significant phantom percentage of Mount A currently for this year? 
Nope. There's none. Nope. Uh, do you know if there was phase out occurring in there? You didn't have? Nope. It's at the elementary level. The phantom students are carried at the elementary level. So Mount Abraham doesn't Mount Abraham doesn't see the phantom students. The elementary schools see the phantom students, as I understand it. And it's, it's at Union High School specifically, where phantom students don't carry into the high school, or whatever grade is at the high school. So for us, it's the elementary, pre-K through six. Do you want to give a heads up about what sure. you want from this? Absolutely. So you should have a yellow form. If you don't, let me know. I can get you another. Uh, and we're really just asking what impressions uh, are you going to take away with you from this meeting? What, what has this presentation left you thinking about? Uh, what lingering questions or thoughts do you have about the budget? And do you have any recommendations or ideas for the board as they ponder this budget? were just really uh, well thought out, and I hope that this budget has really helped you to connect more with the vision of the school and where we're headed. Thank you. So, as, before you go, we would like to, on behalf of the administrative team, wish Jess a happy. <laughs> <laughs>